I'm glad that um, you could join me, those who are present in the room today um, and those who are joining on the screen. I think most of you know who I am, but in case you don't, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jenny Clark, one of the associate pastors um, at Westminster. And my area of focus in my ministry here is in adult spiritual growth. Um, so let me open with a word of prayer and then we will jump in uh, to a, a presentation um, and reflection on winter grace. So would you join me in prayer? Holy God, we give you thanks for this new day and we thank you for health that allows us to be gathered here either in person or on screen. We thank you for friends in Christ whose faces we see and in whose faces we recognize uh, the presence of Christ. Lord, bless our time together. May it be a time of joy and fellowship and a deepening of our life in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So the, the title of today is Winter Grace. And just to be honest with you, I'm drawing a lot from a book. Um, I'll, I'll have a picture of this later on the screen for the people at home. But um, it's a book written um, by Kathleen Fisher called Winter Grace Spirituality for the Later Years. I had read this book a number of years ago, and when Craig asked me to speak today, I said, is there any particular topic? And he kind of left it wide open. So I was like, hmm. And that just sort of was speaking to me. So um, that is what we're going to talk about today, Winter Grace. Now, the word grace has multiple uh, meanings, and so too, in the later years of, of our lives, um, grace has many forms. It can be a time of larger love, of compassion, of attitudes of thoughtfulness to others when maybe before in our lives we were more running a rat race and, and on the hamster wheel that like now maybe we have time to, to enlarge that love and compassion. We also call a temporary um, exemption or reprieve a grace period. And since we are all standing uh, in the certainty of death one day, the gift of several additional years of our lives or decades of life is certainly a period of grace. Aging is both descent and ascent, both loss and gain. And this is true not only of the later years of our lives, but of every uh, stage of our life cycle, childhood, adolescence, midlife, and the older years. At every point of our human life journey, we recognize we, that we have to let go of something in order to move forward and that letting go of whatever it is we need to let go of is a little bit of um, dying to something as well and in that process of letting go and being um, moving forward we are being created anew awakened afresh to the source of our being Jesus challenges his disciples with this paradox when he says, for anyone who wants to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. So a gift of winter, when we are given the gift of winter, and I'll admit, Winter is not my favorite season, <laughs> but I'm learning to appreciate that there are gifts in winter. We can see farther in winter with a clearer vision, paths that were maybe once clogged with vines or leaves in summer that um, kind of hid something that was there all along, but we were not able to see it, or maybe a path opens up to us that we had never noticed before. and there's another way that we might want to take a walk. There is also uh, an inner life awakening. And beneath the shell of the bud on the tree is sap and gestation and the bulbs in the ground that will soon spring forth, uh, bringing life, 
uh, color and new life to follow. In um, Annie Dillard's book, um, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, she describes the grace of winter when she says, it is winter proper, the cold weather has come to stay. I bloom indoors in the winter like a forced forsythia. <clears throat> I come in to come out. At night, I read and write and things I have never understood become clear. I reap the harvest of the rest of the year's planting. The woods are acres of sticks. I could walk to the Gulf of Mexico in a straight line. When the leaves fall, things stand mute and revealed. Everywhere skies extend, vistas deepen, walls become windows and doors open. We speak of being graced by another's presence sometimes. And the graces of winter reach into all the um, relationships of our lives and community, of the people that we come in contact with, and especially with people that we come in contact with who are living in their later years. On another level, grace is the entry of God into the human life. The unmerited love and favor of God shows us the graces of winter are divine gifts that are transforming. They reflect the grace of Christ as gifts of life that emerge um, from a struggle with the forces of death. Winter grace is the capacity to affirm life in the face of death. Now tomorrow, if you are unaware, is Ash Wednesday. Today is Shrove Tuesday. And tomorrow on Ash Wednesday, if we choose, we will be reminded of our mortality and of God's eternal presence with us. We will be reminded that in life and in death, that we belong to God. Now, I also want to talk about memories in, uh, as part of our spiritual journey in the later years. The fear of forgetting uh, and the need to remember both mark the later years of life. Memories enable us to hold fast to our identity and, and um, shape it in new ways. Remembering people and events of our past helps us to claim and to share ourselves. Within all of us still lives somewhere, that child still racing across the, the green grass in the summer in his or her bare feet. As a young adult, finding our path forward after we graduate from high school or college. As an adult, experiencing the path a loved one's death or the pain of a loved one's death. We do not merely have those memories, but we are those memories. My father is now 92 years old, and one of the gifts of this time with him in this season of his life um, that is a gift is listening to the stories he tells and hearing about the people that he shows me in these very old family photos that um, now are on a, a revolving photo screen. I don't know if any of you have it where you can put photos on and it's always like another photo comes up. And so whenever I go to his house um, to eat, he makes me sit on the side of the table so I can see that those photos going and going. And he tells me how at night, like he's going to bed and then the, the thing turns on and he gets sucked into looking at these old photos for another hour and gets to bed later than he intends. He is giving me an incredible gift when he shares um, these memories of his life, these stories of his past, of helping me to know who these people are who maybe were deceased before I was ever born, but are part of my family. He's giving me a gift, but I'm also giving him a gift by asking and engaging in life review with him. 
trying to remember my memories of growing up and him being my my daddy and you know telling these stories to one another and i find um myself now as i have my own grandchildren <laughs> doing a lot of well you know when i was a little girl and telling my stories to them i don't know whether they appreciate them at this point but or if they ever will but what i realize is i'm giving them a gift you know in my sharing these stories i want them to fully know me um, in ways that they don't. And, and I do the same with my kids, you know, telling them, oh, and I was, you know, and um, I'm, I'm sure it's annoying at times, but it's my way of helping them to know me and I want to be known and I want them to know me. Not only is memory fundamental um, to personal identity, it's also cent central to our spiritual identity. Memory reveals God's presence in our lives. Memories retrace a sacred path, a sacred journey that we have been on all throughout our lives, even if we're not aware of it. For instance, memories from our childhood that still bring tears to our eyes decades later are what I would call holy and sacred memories. I had an experience of such sacred memories um, last November. I shared this when I preached, so if you're hearing this, uh, me repeat myself. I'm sorry, I apologize, but back in November, um, I drove down Grove Lane, which is the street I grew up on in Broomall. And I was one of those kids that only lived in one house all my life, one address, never moved. Um, so until I got married, that was, my house, my home. And I drove down the street, that house is owned by someone else now. But, you know, going by, I realized they've changed things. It's not, you know, it's not my house anymore. But that's where all my memories are. That's where my life um, has such meaning and, and began. And the occasion that caused me to drive down my street there in Broomall was we had been in Broomall to Marple Presbyterian Church where I was raised um, by my parents and where I came to faith, where I made lifelong friends who are still very much part of my life and where I was ordained um, to become a Presbyterian pastor and was married nearly 40 years ago. The reason I was there was because we were interring my mother's ashes in the memorial garden at that church. And it's the church where um, Rick uh, Nelson's daughter, Karen, uh, now serves as a pastor. Those for me were holy and sacred memories. Each of you also possess your own holy and sacred memories. The Hebrew scriptures uh, speaks of the old as full of days. And there's some scriptures uh, references there where they speak of Abraham um, as full of days, Isaac and uh, David and Job. Memory is another word for presence. Events that are finished still through memory live on in our lives. We are all full of days. We all um, have experience. Um, we are all that we have experienced, even if maybe we're not able to remember uh, or be conscious of everything that has affected us. But we are a full, we are full of all those things that, that have shaped us through our lives. The relationships that we've had during our lifetime have not been simply passing external occurrences, but essential to our becoming. They have entered the fabric of our lives, shaping us for who we are today. And the past isn't, um, as I think sometimes we think of it, um, it's not slipping away or distancing itself from us but rather it's piling up in us through memory, contri contributing to our present. 
And that's why remembering is such a basic thing in appreciating and, and holding on to our sense of our self-worth. <clears throat> Faith is an essential dimension in our remembering. In faith, we not only gather our memories, but we recollect our lives before God. Our stories and our memories then take on new meaning as part of a larger story, which embraces and redeems them. That's the larger story of God in Jesus Christ. And such remembering is the biblical way of appropriating the, appropriating the past, and it's the basis for our spiritual identity. For instance, at each key juncture in her life, Israel retold her story of what God had done for her, how God had remained faithful in the midst of her infidelities, how God's presence had sustained her in times of trial. And by remembering, she made God's love present again with power. So this is a this picture is a um, mosaic uh, that was in Rome, but it's it's depicting um, Israel's deliverance through the Red Sea, the waters uh, from their bondage and slavery uh, to it, the wilderness where they would then go to the Promised Land. So um, I said, remembering that story, and that story. Israel would tell over and over again um, to help them remember God when they were going through their difficulties. By remembering, she made God's love present again with power, no matter what their circumstances at that moment were. And out of those memories arose new courage and hope that God's promises would be once again fulfilled. Like Israel, we um, also tell and we retell our stories since they have levels of meaning which cannot be captured simply in telling at one time. And sometimes the retelling of stories feels like, oh my gosh, I've heard this one before, but it's making meaning. It's making meaning for the person who's telling it. Faith is the recounting of God's presence in our journey through time. And this is especially true as we grow older and experience more fully how temporary our earthly life is. As we grow older, we may find it more difficult to recall details like names or dates, but often we can remember key moments of our past lives, events and decisions that profoundly impacted us, blessings that friends brought to us, difficulties that we conquered and successes we achieved, griefs and joys that we have known. These key moments are more important than the details um, that we may forget. And I, I put up a quote here from Fred, Frederick Beekner. He says, listen to your life, see it for the fathomless mystery that it is the boredom and pain of it no less than in the excitement and gladness. Touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it, because in the last analysis all moments are key moments, and life itself is grace. These key moments of our life are more important than the details that we might forget. Remembering these dimensions of our lives before God can strengthen not only our identity and our self-worth, but an awareness of God's presence with us all along the way. I'm going to share with you an exercise of life review that um, I was invited to be do on a um, contemplative <coughs> retreat that I attended, gosh, probably 20 years ago now, but I've, I've done it over again, several different times uh, over the years as I've aged. And, and what you do is you, you form a chart for yourself. I did it in a, in, like in a notebook, I drew it, but yeah, I created it this way um, just to show you. So if you are inclined to want to try doing this for yourself, you'd have a sense of what, 
how you might go about it. So you make on a sheet three columns and the title of the first column is chapters of my life and you come up with a title for a chapter of your life. And then in this middle column, you would have signs of grace. And then the third column, times of brokenness and pain. So, you know, you might divide up your life however you want. I just gave an example here, but you might do it more by marriage or, you know, whatever. But I, you know, I just said like birth to five years and, and then you would take time to remember and reflect on that chapter of your life, what, what you've been told, what you know, um, and, and put down in that middle column signs of grace that you notice in that chapter of your life. And then the other final third um, column, you know, times of brokenness and pain in that chapter of your life. And you go through that same, you know, with each one, you, you might find certain chapters of your life need a bigger space between the next chapter, just because there's more things that you want to write in there. But um, this might take over several pages to do if you're really writing memories down and, but you know, find a title for a, a, per, a chapter of your life, however you want to define that. What were the signs of grace in there and reflect on that and times of the brokenness and pain. And, and as you go through that, you finish it then go back and look at it and notice what stands out for you. This was a very, very meaningful exercise for me. Um, and that's why I've engaged in it multiple times over my life. Um, it's been revealing to me um, in doing this, the things that come back in my memory and you might work on this for you know, a month or so, because if you know things when you start remembering like new things, oh my gosh, I forgot about that, you know, and you want to add that to that, you know, and you can go back and keep filling it fuller. But what I noticed when I went back and looked at the, the whole thing after I did it, that in the times of the brokenness and pain in my life, there were amazing signs of grace in that same period, which I don't know that I ever like reflected on that and noticed that by noticing that, I just re realized that in all those broken, painful places in my lives, God was there. I see, as I remember, these signs of grace that pointed it out. And I found that very powerful and very comforting and very hopeful. Um, it was healing for me of some of the, the hard things that maybe I was remembering, recognizing, oh yeah, Remember that where God was through, you know, a person or something else that happened to me in that time. It's a remembering of God's presence, which then leads me into the future with hope. The healing of memories um, for us re depends on recognizing that there is no point in life that's too late for God's call to new life. So. You know, if there are things that we're still wrestling with or memories that are too painful, we don't want to revisit, God can still heal them. And um, God can still offer us uh, hope and new life um, moving forward. Just want to stop right there. Are there any questions that anybody has about what I just described here in that chart? All right. So it's just an exercise you might consider um, trying uh, some time. So often as we attempt uh, to round out our lives in the later years, we also find that we need to forgive ourselves because you'll, you'll see things in that chart where, you know, I wish I'd done something different. I wish <clears throat> things could have been different. Um, such forgiveness of forgiving ourselves is part of accepting the forgiveness and the healing of God. We have hurt others during our lifetimes, intentionally or unintentionally. We've made mistakes in bringing up our children or mistakes in the way we've behaved, decisions we've made, choices we've made. We are conscious of what we might have done better and would do differently could we do it all again. Growing older requires the acceptance of the unfulfilled we need to be gentle with our limitations. 
as Christians, we know that our stories are embraced and redeemed by that larger story of Jesus. That story is a story of God's love and mercy. And if God has so forgiven us, we must be ready to forgive ourselves. And Jesus helps us to do it. If we walk through our life cycle with him, Jesus helps us to gain wisdom and wholeness as we come to accept our one and only life cycle. And this picture that I have here of this bowl, um, this is Kintsuchi. It's an ancient Japanese art of repairing ceramics with lacquer and gold uh, into delicate and beautiful creations. And I, I just think it's a, a great metaphor of what God does with us in those broken places of our lives and takes them and, and makes us beautiful, repairing us, repairing what has been broken and healing and redeeming it. So symbolic uh, actions or rituals are a fundamental way that we remember. They allow us to express the deepest emotional levels of our memories and it's important um, to have those rituals in times of joy, as well as in times of loss, times of death, and times of celebration. In Exodus, um, it speaks of the way that ritual would help God's people uh, to remember that God brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the land of plenty. That Passover ritual serves as a reminder of how God brought his people out of Egypt, delivering them and, and giving them a new life. The Eucharist or communion is the deep expression of winter grace. It reenacts in symbol and paradox that death leads to new life. So in the bread that is blessed and broken, it becomes food for the world. And one of the later gifts of later the later years is for us to become Eucharist or communion to one another, to nourish others from the riches of our personal experiences of brokenness and God's grace and blessing in our lives. So also um, we want to reflect um, on dying. Uh, spirituality for the later years requires coming to terms with the concluding phase of our lives, requiring a theology of dying. Dying in, as an imitation of Christ requires the surrendering of our lives to gain it afresh as a gift from God. Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians, um, and he ponders in this, the paradox that life somehow comes through death, making us, he makes a statement that could be seen as a description of the dying process when he says uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, that is why there is no weakening on our part. And instead, though this outer person of ours may be falling into decay, the inner person is renewed day by day. Paul sees uh, the resurrection already at work in Christ's followers by the power of the spirit who dwells in them. While the outward person wastes away, this new existence is already taking shape in us. Um, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, uh, he filled out this meaning, I think, of what Paul is describing in words but he refers to old age as a time, not of stagnation, but of opportunity for personal growth. When he writes, the years of old age may enable us to attain the high values we failed to sense, the insights we have missed, the wisdom we ignored. They are indeed formative years, rich in possibilities to unlearn the follies of a lifetime, to see through inbred self-deceptions, to deepen understanding and compassion, to widen the horizon of honesty, to refine the sense of fairness. In light of Paul's words, 
such growth as uh, Abraham Heschel is describing would be an expression of life in the spirit within us. Evidence that the power of this new age uh, is already at work in us. And earlier in his letter to the second Corinthians, Paul reminds us that the Christian light, whoops, went backwards here. Paul sees the resurrection. Um, oh, wait a minute. In the second letter of the Corinthians, Paul upon, all right, I'm sorry about that. I'm repeating myself. I have to get back to my notes. So earlier in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul reminds us that the Christian church is a continuous process of self-identifying with Christ. He says that we carry within our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our body. Resurrection is the implausible notion that sustains us as Christians. The power of the resurrection is not reserved to some future age, but it's now at work in our lives. I love Kathleen Fisher's um, quote here, the deepest grace of winter is the faith that there will be yet another spring. In John's gospel, Jesus speaks of the mystery of resurrection in terms of a grain of wheat which dies to produce an abundant harvest. But he declares that this future fulfillment is also present in uh, the reality of now saying, I tell you most solemnly the hour will come. In fact, it's here already when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and all who hear it will live. And that's from John 5, 25. And Christian love is the sign that we have passed from death to life. In um, 1 John 3, 14, it says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Anyone who does not love remains in death. So as we journey through our later years, we may experience a sense of freedom, of becoming less um, dependent on human opinion or willing to take a risk to stand up for what we believe and what is right. Perhaps we are finally able to move beyond fears that have bound us for much of our lives. We can pull back from some of the busyness and distractedness of our lives, pull back from activities and things that cluttered our lives, and grow in simplicity and a widening of love. And finally, um, our lives are a series of births and deaths. Resurrection is always preceded by powerlessness. It's always the miracle of being given new life. And I want to leave us with this quote from Kathleen Fisher. And again, this is the book that I re referenced in the beginning that um, I've, I've drawn a lot from her book um, and sharing what I'm sharing with you today. She says, older people find in their present experiences of dying and rising reasons to hope in the reality of life after death. They offer that hope to us all. For in the paradoxes of their lives, strength in the midst of frailty, perseverance in the midst of brokenness, love despite pain and suffering, spiritual ascent transcending physical decline, faith and life engagement at the edge of death, they witness to that miracle of new life, which is the heart of the Christian faith. Older persons are winter grace, not just for themselves and each other, but for all of us. And I want to just open it up now and invite um, all of you to, to share um, any personal experiences you have of winter grace. Nick. Um, thank you for this presentation. I, I, I found it really wonderful and meaningful. So let me, let me start that one. The, the second thing um, 
I happen to personally believe that we're called by name even before we're born. That we come into this world with the mission that God entrusted us with, and some of us achieve it better than others, and some don't achieve it at all. So I think I would add two columns to that chart. One column would be at those different stages in our life, how did we feel God's presence? What awareness did we have of him? Um, obviously, in childhood, we're not going to have that many kinds of feelings. But certainly as we go along in our aging, I think it does become important. And I do think it changes and deepens as we get older. So I would have a column about what was our awareness of God's presence during those different Nick, stages. Nick, just, yeah. just that's, that would fall under the graces, what you just described. I would okay. put, put that under yeah. graces, yeah. Well, well, okay. I mean, I might differ with you because I, I think All of right, grace yeah. probably differently than you do. But the other thing I, I would say is how did we relate to others during those, those age periods? What did we do and what was our sense of feeling of responsibility and obligation to others at each of those stages? So that's just my suggestion of two other columns. Thank you. Any other um, reflections or uh, observations of winter grace? Do you think of winter grace? I mean, I guess, is that is that a term that um, fits with you? I think it fits. I had never thought of it that way, but I think if we reflect on where God has been in our life and where he currently is, it, it would behoove us at least for me to consciously think about that as rather than just taking things for granted. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it would probably create a deeper faith. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some people consciously think of that much more than what I have thought of it, but mm -hmm. I think it'd be a, a good exercise to, to do. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be a difficult exercise to do. Initially, I don't know your experience, you said you've gone through that creating that list a couple of times or refining it more than once, but I would guess. Adding to it because yeah. I age. <laughs> you age, right? yes. Yeah. But as you add to it or the, when you, after the first time you do it, it's probably more focused as you add to it because you can reflect upon the things that you had previously written down and it's cumulative as opposed to working with a blank sheet of paper. Oh yeah, and, and then you also have a new chapter of your life to, to add in there. You, know, you define your chapters how you want. I broke it for this purpose just into 10 years, but you might want to, instead of saying my, my 80s or my 70s, you might say, you know, my, my work life or, you know, whatever you want to say. You can make it whatever you want, but yeah. Thank you. Any other personal experience of winter grace? I mean, what, one other thing I would say is that I find as I'm deteriorating physically, and, and we all know what that means, you know, you wake up a new day with a new pain or a new ache or something you haven't experienced before, or you can tell your memory is starting to slip. But as your physical strengths begin to weaken, I do find a deepening of my thought processes and feelings about life, both in a reflective way, but also in terms of what I want to accomplish before it ends. Mm -hmm. um, so it does give me a lot of strength and inspiration to do and examine things I may not have had time or been able to before. And I think also with the decline of physical traits, I do think inside of you, your spiritual and emotional side heightens. And I think the importance of relationships with other people heightens. So I, I look at it as there's kind of an exchange going on. That for everything you give up physically, there's something emotionally and spiritually you can pick up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other 
Thank you. Any other thoughts about anything that we I, I shared with you or questions? Dave. Hi, this is Dave. Hi, this is Dave. I, I really um, enjoyed your talk. It really brought some new spirituality into my kind of view of the world. Um, I think it's important, uh, this is building off something Nick said, that we do look at our life in those, as on that table, in where we put ourselves versus others. So I think in my teenage years, I was the star of this track team, this cross country team. You know, I was such a, a, a man <laughs> and, and I was the dude who could do it all. And I think there comes a time as we're growing where we realize it's not us. It's not about us, it's about others. And how much have we, have we helped others? How much have we put others before ourselves? It's very difficult to do, but um, uh, Jenny, I think it, you've really helped me think about, you know, am I pounding my chest Look how good I look, how, how healthy I am, and I can do anything. Or am I trying to make everybody else around me more successful? And I, I, I think that's kind of what I've taken out of this winter of grace. I also think it's a winter's grace when I don't get a lot of s snow to shovel, but that's kind of a different, <laughs> different thing. Thank you. That's, that's part of that wisdom, but um, expanding um, love and, and awareness. Jenny, yeah. I just was thinking uh, about your presentation. I think it would be good to have this presentation, maybe just a little bit, presented to the young adults. Mm -hmm and have them calibrate their thinking as they go through the stages of life, rather than waiting until we're in that later stage mm -hmm. and reflecting backward, but to right. understand okay. that there's a continuum. What I just think it would be neat mm -hmm. for the young people to hear the, the words, to hear the thinking of mm -hmm. this presentation. Well, and I think there's such value in younger people and older people being intergenerational in, in groups oh. and, and because you do hear one another's stories and you, you grow from one another. And, you know, if, if we as older people are open to listening to their truth and not like trying to tell them how to do it, but if they're also open to hearing our stories and I think stories and our memories are the things that are powerful. It's not that like you should, but it's it's sharing your truth, sharing what you encountered in your life that I think we can appreciate people, even people we don't necessarily agree with or maybe even like, but when you hear their story, it, it kind of, it opens up some communication and some relationship and, um, and to me, winter grace that you're seeing things differently because it was covered before to you. Um, well, that's like Cheryl yeah. and Love. One of the most joyous parts of Cheryl's week is working Sunday nights yeah. with the uh, seat with the youth group, mm -hmm. with the junior high, senior high youth group. She comes home tired but mm -hmm. joyful. She said, "I said you're tired." She said, "Yeah, but I'm so happy. I feel so uplifted. Mm -hmm. Working, you know, just enjoying time with them. They have a great time." Yeah. So, well, I think that's, you know, I don't know if it was this way generations before, but we're so um, siloed, you know, children go here, you know, middle-aged people go there, older adults, you know, we don't like 
<laughs> we have a group that meets, you know, reality, they have to be in school, but we don't have those intergenerational. We don't have, for the most part, grandparents growing up in the house with us. You know, everybody lives in a different city or a different state now, and we don't interact in the way that we might have in a, in a different age and time. Oh, 10 minutes until the next scheduled meeting. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. That's standard message. It doesn't matter. Oh, is that always? Oh. Hmm. Yeah. I've never seen that. We see it every Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the system generates it. <laughs> Any other thoughts or reflections of your own? What for you have been gifts of um, of winter stage of life? Um, would you see this as a gift? I didn't understand the question. Say that again. What's, what's the question? So, assuming that most of us here would recognize we are in that later years of our lives, that that winter grace time. You know, what, how has this time of your life been gift? I know there's lots of, you know, like you said, waking up with more aches and pains and more losses and things, but what have, what has been positive for you about this time of life? Well, one thing I can say is that, you know, when I was out there trying to make a living and build a home with, with two children and a wife, I didn't have time to do a lot of things that would cross my mind. And now that I'm at this stage of life, even though I happen to be working full time at Home Depot, um, I find myself much more both self-reflective and reflective about the world. And as I said earlier, what do I wanna accomplish? Assuming I have another 10 or 20 years, what do I really wanna accomplish in those 10 what is it that I want to do that I can help other people with? So since joining Westminster just to be concrete, you know, I'm a deacon. Um, I help with the Wednesday night Bible study. Um, I've taken on other jobs and roles at the church, but those are things I never could have done, you know, when I was working to support a family and raise two daughters. Mm -hmm. So that time that you get, if you spend it well, can be very constructive. And I, and I think when you're on your final deathbed, I, for me, it's going to be, what did I do that helped somebody else? What did I do that made somebody else's life less painful? How many times did I pray for somebody who is really sick that God's grace would make their pain easier? Um, so for me, it, it's a very, it's, it's a great time that I have, I have that blessing to be able to think about these things. Mm -hmm. Not to worry about the next presentation I'm gonna do for a client or what kind of product I'm gonna sell more than I did last year. Um, it's more about what on the human side could I accomplish and do for others. And you know, the other thing we know as we're aging is we're not as physically appealing. Young people look at us and think, you know, we're these old crotchety, ugly people, whatever they think of us. But we know inside there's an eternal summer in each of us, that each of us does still have a childhood in us. We still do have, you know, the wonder of a child, that we still can pass on a lot of good information to others. So I, I see it as a blessing. You know, nobody wants to die, but on the other hand, it's a blessing that we're able to concentrate on things we never could concentrate before Thank and to you. accomplish something positive. Yeah. yeah. I can say one thing before. <laughs> yeah, and it has given me, uh, getting old, uh, it's given me the time to really smell the flowers. You know, mm -hmm. I, I take each day very <clears throat> special and I give myself time to 
reflect on, on a bird or, or nature much more so than I when I was younger and I was too busy. Mm -hmm. It's just given me the time to reflect spiritually and physically on very small, small things that have happened during the day. Noticing those things that you might have walked past before. And take it for granted. Yeah. yeah. I see a blade of grass and, and study it or mm -hmm. do something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so I cool. think, you know, is a love-hate relationship with me, but um, <laughs> but now I can just sit there and look at a crocus just coming up and, and, and small, small things that make a day special. Yeah. That's what older age for me has been so great and fun to me. That's beautiful. Thank you. And with that, I have to read. Okay. <laughs> and happy, happy uh, Mardi Gras day. <laughs> <laughs> we have about five more minutes before. I don't know. Does this shut off? When it, when you're able to. Well, you must have one right. that's really backed up to it. But okay. Sometimes it's just another on the church calendar, but okay. it may be in another room. <clears throat> Any other comments or reflections? Dave. Dave Goodell. Dave. Well, I, one thing I've noticed is, and this kind of, again, Nick, is I'm kind of putting in different words what Nick was saying, but when I was working, um, I would leave before sunrise and come after home after sunset. And I really think I'm seeing my grandchildren like a ton more than I've seen my uh, my kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, it's a different perspective. How can I help my kids more since I'm spending 24 seven on certain days with my grandkids, mm -hmm. uh, chasing them, uh, playing hide and seek with them, although they're really not hiding. I have to pretend they are. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's it, it's, uh, it's a whole new world that I've been blessed with, I guess is the right way to say it. So it's part of my winter grace. There's mm -hmm. quite a bit of snow on top of this mountain. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I really think there's blessings if we, we can look for them and opportunities to help others that it's, you know, each, each new day, try to approach it with a little bit of uh, less of self and more of others. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, is there anything else that anybody has? Because I, I can clo close us with a prayer if you'd like me to you can do that. Gracious Lord, we do stand in awe of your grace that is poured upon us, um, that our stories are caught up in your stories, um, in the story of Christ. Lord, we pray as we go from this gathering into our day that we would take with us that um, openness to stop and smell the roses, to pay attention to the ways that you are moving today in our lives, but also the ways that you were there for us in our past. Help us to be a Eucharist for others that we encounter, sharing our um, good news stories of your love, your grace, your healing, your redemption, and your new life that you are creating in us even now. We give ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome.